The invasion of Ukraine has been a disaster so far for Russia and widely seen as a catastrophic blunder for Vladimir Putin. Every credible international security analyst and observer of Russian politics have expressed disbelief at how badly the Russian invasion has gone and how Putin has put himself and his country in an impossible position. How could Putin have gotten it wrong so badly? This is a man known for his pragmatism, his cunning and hard-headed political calculation. How could he make such a catastrophic blunder? I think there is an old saying that applies here. The pride goes before the fall. The most credible explanation of Putin's miscalculation is that he is a victim of his own success and that all his past victories have set the stage for this blunder, which was a long time in the making. The Ukraine invasion was a reckoning moment for Putin and his regime. When someone succeeds at something, they get validation from their environment. This validation tells them that they've perceived their environment correctly, and not only was their perception correct, their actions led to good outcomes. They gain confidence in their ability to act upon the world around them and change their environment. This is how people gain confidence and self-esteem. Increased confidence and self-esteem allows them to move forward in the world in a way that is more seamless, with less internal friction, because there will be less self-doubt after repeated successes. It establishes a positive self-reinforcing cycle epitomized in the saying, from strength to strength. But there is a dark side to success also. Because of the validation of success, critical or doubtful voices are pushed aside. At its best, confidence overcomes self-limiting beliefs. At its worst, confidence breeds arrogance. Arrogant views of the world are vulnerable to being blind to when reality has changed beyond one's understanding. At its best, confidence overcomes feelings of unworthiness. At its worst, confidence creates entitlement. You begin to think that because you have won so many times before, victory is guaranteed. This is how yesterday's victory can set the stage for tomorrow's defeat. Just as a major victory is made up of several small victories, a major mistake is made up of several small mistakes. For Putin, the success he's enjoyed over his 21-year rule caused overconfidence in several areas, each of which contributed to the disaster that now faces Russia. Let's examine each of these well, there are several things to bear in mind about Vladimir Putin. First of all, he's been in power now for 22 years. It's not like he's just appeared on the scene. So a lot of us have been watching him for a very long time. And I think that there's um, something that you know holds true throughout history. If you look at people who've been in power for a very long time, they start to get deluded about their own, their own role in history, their own role in their society. They kind of think of themselves as indispensable. And they also start to think of themselves as infallible. And so this is always a very dangerous period when someone's been in power for so long where they start to make mistakes. And you know, one can say that this has been a miscalculation, although Putin, of course, will try to turn it the other way. But uh, I think that this is at the root of some of the issues that we're looking at today, somebody who's been in power, and also in a very unchecked manner for such a long time. Because over the last 22 years that he has been in power, he's recently amended the constitution to stay theoretically in power even longer, until 2036, you know, for example. He doesn't, he's a member of a political party, so there's nothing really to rein him in, uh, in the political system. He's turned the Russian parliament into basically a rubber stamp parliament. There's no checks from the court system. There's no equivalent of a Supreme Court. There's a constitutional court. And the only thing is really his popularity among the Russian people. Putin is determined to dominate and control Ukraine to shape its orientation. Um, you know, this is a matter of deep personal conviction for him. He's been stewing in a combustible combination of grievance and ambition for many years. Um, that personal conviction matters more than ever in the Russian system. He's created a system in which his own circle of advisors is narrower and narrower. COVID has made that even narrower. Um, and it's a system in which it's not proven career enhancing for people to question or challenge his judgment. There's a deep and abiding patriotism inside Russia, as well as inside the Russian regime. So they understand that Putin in many ways rescued the Russian state from the chaos of the 1990s. They understand that Russia was in very bad shape as an incoherent failing state almost when Putin took over and that he did some important things for Russia's stability and consolidation. There's also some uh, appreciation that Putin stood up to the West and stood up to more powerful countries and regained a sense of pride 
and maneuverability for Russia in the international system. People appreciate that, and it's real. It's not imagined that Putin accomplished that. The problem is the methods that he accomplished it with. He used the kind of methods, that is to say, taking other people's property, putting other people in jail for political reasons. He used the kind of methods that are not conducive to long-term growth and stability. So he fixed the problem, but he fixed the problem and then created even bigger long-term problems, potentially. And moreover, all authoritarian regimes that use those methods um, are tempted to keep using them and using them and using them until they're the only ones who are the beneficiaries. And the group narrows and narrows. The elite gets smaller and narrower. The interest groups get excluded from power and their ability to uh, continue enjoying the fruits of the system. And the resentment grows. For Russia, the consequences of Putin's domination is that the personal prejudices of a very small circle of people form the basis for Russian military planning in this invasion. Putin's entire military strategy relied on being able to just overwhelm Ukrainian military resistance within 72 hours, because after 72 hours, his troops ran out of fuel and out of food. This is where we see videos of abandoned tanks and Russian troops stealing fruit from stores. In a recent Atlantic article, David French writes about how Putin's ambitious plan to take on multiple fronts meant that each individual front didn't have enough power to really overcome Ukrainian defenses at any given point. Why did Putin assume that the Ukrainians would just melt away? It's likely that Putin was influenced by the example of the Afghan government, which faded away before the Taliban. Perhaps Putin fixated a little too much on a situation where the US would be humiliated twice in the same fashion. Perhaps he drew some kind of generalization that Western values were inherently cowardly and weak, so its regimes were also cowardly and weak. There was no one in his inner circle to impress upon him that even if they were smaller, the Ukrainian military was a capable fighting force honed by years of combat in eastern Ukraine, and that everyone outside the separatist areas hated him for annexing Crimea and for starting a war in the Donbass region in 2014. Any competent Russian military planner could have told him that his ambitious multiple front lightning war might grind to a halt if the Ukrainians didn't simply roll over and die within 72 hours. The publicly televised meeting of Putin with his National Security Council days before the invasion was a carefully orchestrated event. The show of power was not subtle. Putin's official domination over the machinery of the Russian state was on full display. Even the visuals conveyed this power dynamic, how large his image was compared to how small his officials seemed to be. This event demonstrated his domination over the Russian state. Putin is a classic strongman. His approach to his environment is submit or be destroyed. Critics and political rivals are jailed or killed. Putin even stole the Super Bowl ring from the New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft. In this way, Putin's style of leadership can truly be called gangster. Obtaining submission and compliance through stealing, backed up by a credible threat of violence. In other countries, naked displays of power are discouraged, even if everyone knows who really holds the power behind the scenes. Not in Putin's Russia, where his overt use of power defines all his interactions. The following video reveals the extent to which his strongman style influenced his official interactions with Ukraine. Нравится, не нравится, терпимая красавица. Тут, конечно, безусловно, есть вещи, с которыми не поспоришь с президентом Российской Федерации. Украина действительно красавица. А вот по поводу моя, ты еще кажу про Украину, что моя тут, мне кажется, это уже перебор небольшой. In a well-known gaff. President Biden let it slip that if Russia only launched a limited incursion into eastern Ukraine, Western response would have been divided. This very openly signaled to Putin that a limited invasion of eastern Ukraine would be much more of a sure thing. What made him decide to launch the full invasion? I think the most credible explanation is simply that he's accustomed to using overwhelming force to get his way because everyone fears him and the reputation of the Russian army. And because everyone feared him, no one told him that the outrage at a total invasion might cause every single Ukrainian to overcome their fear and fight. 
A lot of the state officials in Russia, for certain, are corrupt. There's no question. Many of them, however, are patriotic. And many of them feel badly about where the country has been going. They would prefer that the country was less corrupt. They would prefer that there were greater investment in all sorts of areas of Russia. They might even themselves steal less if they could be guaranteed that everybody else would steal less. Every government on earth is prone to some form of corruption. However, the overt state-sanctioned corruption established by the Putin regime is at a level that could be considered kleptocratic. There is no better example of this corruption as the Olympic doping scandal shown in the documentary Icarus. A culture of corruption also had implications for Russia's military performance in the invasion. A report stated that Russian soldiers sold fuel in the black market in Belarus and that this was routine practice for them during annual military exercises when it turned out that they would actually invade Ukraine, which the soldiers were only told last minute. Such customary corruption compounded their logistical and morale problems. The corruption in defense procurement has also undermined logistics, manifesting in soldiers receiving inadequate equipment and supplies on the ground. This includes rations that expired in 2015. Putin and his inner circle stole as a matter of course, but somehow Putin did not factor in everyone else's stealing when making assessments of their realistic military strength. But in Russia, there was a group of men who had seen how this very lack of belief in politics and dark uncertainty about the future could work to their advantage. What they had done was turn politics into a strange theatre, where nobody knew what was true or what was fake any longer. They were called political technologists, and they were the key figures behind President Putin. They had kept him in power, unchallenged, for 15 years. Some of them had been dissidents back in the 1970s and had been powerfully influenced by the science fiction writings of the Strugatsky brothers. Twenty years later, when Russia fell apart after the end of communism, they rose up and took control of the media. And they used it to manipulate the electorate on a vast scale. For them, reality was just something that could be manipulated and shaped into anything you wanted it to be. But then a technologist emerged who went much further, and his ideas would become central to Putin's grip on power. He was called Vladislav Surkov. Surkov came originally from the theatre world, and those who have studied his career say that what he did was take avant-garde ideas from the theatre and bring them into the heart of politics. Surkov's aim was not just to manipulate people, but to go deeper and play with and undermine their very perception of the world, so they are never sure what is really happening. Surkov turned Russian politics into a bewildering, constantly changing piece of theatre. He used Kremlin money to sponsor all kinds of groups, from mass anti-fascist youth organisations to the very opposite, neo-Nazi skinheads. and liberal human rights groups who then attacked the government. Surkov even backed whole political parties that were opposed to President Putin. But the key thing was that Surkov then let it be known that this was what he was doing, which meant that no one was sure what was real or what was fake in modern Russia. As one journalist put it, it's a strategy of power that keeps any opposition constantly confused a ceaseless shape-shifting that is unstoppable because it is indefinable. Despite his views on the weaknesses of the left in the West, Putin was himself a very postmodernist leader in that truth was entirely manufactured by making everyone doubt everything at all times. This type of hybrid war was used very effectively inside Russia and abroad it's likely that his reliance on hybrid war to create truth made Putin forget that there is an objective reality that he had to contend with, that manipulation and clever tricks could only go so far. Putin characterized the Zelensky government as neo-Nazis and drug addicts and a colony of the United States. It is highly possible that in his flawed military planning, he started to believe his own propaganda. 
As the invasion plays out politically, domestically inside Russia, Putin will find out how far his disinformation can really go. Putin has told his population that the war is a limited special operation, limited only to the separatist regions of Ukraine, and that the Ukrainian neo-Nazi regime is threatening to genocide ethnic Russians, and that the Russian military is not targeting civilians. As the mass of the Russian population slowly absorbs the indicators of the real situation, they will find out the truth is the exact opposite, that it was an outright invasion, that it was all over Ukraine, and that it was against the Ukrainian government and population, and that they explicitly targeted civilians. The gulf between the lie and the truth is so great, the consequences of the war so enormous, both morally and economically, that the reaction of the large segment of the Russian population who have placed their trust in Putin is unpredictable, but will ultimately be decisive. Over several high-profile incidents over the past decade, Putin successfully and openly challenged the liberal democratic world order. And he did it in a way where the consequences did not prevent him from doing it again. In 2014, Putin annexed Crimea, launching an invasion using Russian army units disguised in unmarked green combat suits. Putin announced that this was not a Russian military operation, but a spontaneous action of local citizens not controlled by Russia. The speed of this operation and the denial of official involvement created just enough confusion that neither Ukraine or Western governments could mount a meaningful response. Putin had read the situation perfectly. In Syria in 2013, horrifying images of a chemical weapons attack on civilians by the Assad regime circulated on social media. The use of chemical weapons crossed the US red line. President Obama considered bombing the Syrian chemical weapons plant. Instead, Putin managed to convince the Obama administration that they would work with their Syrian allies and guarantee that their chemical weapons would be eliminated. Putin even published an op-ed in the New York Times imploring Americans that violence would not help the situation in Syria. Not long after, Russia directly intervened in Syria to prop up the Assad regime. Russian airstrikes systematically targeted hospitals, schools, power plants, and led to widespread civilian casualties. To add insult to injury, a chemical weapons attack against civilians by the Syrian government in 2017 proved the Russians did not actually dispose of all the chemical weapons. The Obama administration was humiliated, and US reputation in the region suffered. In 2016, Russia successfully attacked the heart of US democracy itself through their unique brand of hybrid war. Under the name Internet Research Agency, Russian agents weaponized tools of social media and created effective and creative propaganda to ramp up existing polarization in the U.S. to dangerous levels. They backed one major U.S. political party against the other, backing a candidate that they assessed would cause maximum internal conflict. They effectively politicized U.S. intelligence services, as a large percentage of Americans doubted their assessment that Russia was behind it. The consequences of these actions are still being felt to this day, with polarization in America defining domestic politics. Add to this more minor examples, such as the blatant assassination of ex-Russian spy Alexander Livinenko through poisoning in London. Livinenko fled Russia after being openly critical of the Putin regime. Time and time again, Putin got his way, not just inside Russia, but around the world. In so doing, Putin ensured that the culture of corruption and violence which defined his regime challenged the rules-based liberal international order. Having these string of successes, it is likely that Putin believed that this situation would be no different. What Putin failed to consider was that he was successful in the past because his actions always flaunted and challenged the liberal international order. He never tried to destroy it. What Putin failed to see was that his invasion of Ukraine would be perceived as an existential threat to the liberal international order. If an authoritarian country is allowed to blatantly invade and destroy democracy with the whole world watching based on the whims of an autocrat, then the world as we know it would be shattered. I think Western nations feared this was a real possibility. After all, the COVID-19 pandemic revealed deep contradictions in the democratic system. Few places successfully balanced public health and individual freedoms. The question of truth and misinformation deeply divided societies and divided the governments from their own populations. I believe that it is this backdrop that caused such a deep reaction in Western countries in defense of Ukraine, which is now seen as a symbol for the liberal international order. To Putin's credit, there was no indication that democracies would unite. It's a reaction that surprised Westerners themselves. 
Finally, here's a question that's not asked very much. How could he? Putin said Ukrainians and Russians are one people, even if he thinks they're the little sister of Russia. But this is not how you treat family. So many Ukrainians and Russians refused to believe that he would actually cross the line and kill what are basically his own people. So what happened to Putin? On this, I think the key might be in Putin's anger, which seemed to boil over in his televised statements. An anger that longtime observers thought was just out of character for him. It's possible that as time passed, he got older and his anger just got the best of him. The Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca thought of anger as a disease of the mind which twists an innately good human nature into something evil. He writes, quote, Mankind is born for mutual assistance, anger for mutual ruin. The former loves society, the latter estrangement. The one loves to do good, the other to do harm. The one to help even strangers, the other to attack even its dearest friends. The one is ready to sacrifice itself for the good of others, the other to plunge in the peril, provided drags others with it. Everything works until it doesn't. The geopolitical disaster that Putin has forced onto the Ukrainian people, the Russian people, and all peoples around the world, was a product of many different inputs. It's a reminder to all autocratic leaders who believe in their infallibility, and has now become an unpredictable crisis that has already and will continue to transform the world. Thanks for watching. If you appreciate these videos, please like and subscribe.